All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I am thrilled. There's a lot of new faces. Uh, again, my name is Lance Marshall. This is The Gathering. I just want to welcome you uh, to being a part of this place. So one of the things that we do here in The Gathering is uh, break out topics into something we call series. Uh, they're, they're a series of communications. We'll kind of dig on a topic for a couple weeks in a row. Um, sometimes those are on things like books of the Bible. We'll dig through a book of the Bible for an extended period of time, uh, maybe a story from the Bible. Maybe we'll dig on a conversation that needs to, to go in depth a little bit further. Uh, we just did a series on God and science, uh, how we can be faithful Christians, and how we can also uh, ex- accept and embrace the different understandings that science teaches us about God's creation. All of this, if you ever want to follow it, is available on our YouTube page. If you just search First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, uh, or if you search The Gathering uh, on podcasts, you can find links to all this. You can catch up on everything. I'm glad that you're with us. And so uh, we're starting a new series that's going to go on for the next seven weeks. And uh, I was thinking, I want to do a series on some of the most sensitive topics, right? The things that everyone really wants to talk about. The kind of things that dominate the conversation when you're with your best friends or the people that you really trust, the kind of things that across every culture uh, and every community that at the end of the day, it's the things we all want to talk about. Uh, I want to talk about topics that we normally don't talk about explicitly enough in church, I don't think. I want to talk specifically about sex, death, and money from a church perspective. And so I thought, and I was like, what is the best name I can come up with (laughs) for a sermon series that really helps communicate that I want to talk about sex, death, and money. And as you can tell, I'm very creative. Ideas come to me all the time. And this is what we're going to be talking about uh, for the next uh, seven weeks. And so we're going to be breaking a couple of weeks on each one of these and then another one to follow it up. So this first couple of weeks, I want to talk about sex. Uh, I want to talk about sex, and particularly from a biblical and a Christian perspective, and just from a realistic community perspective. But I want to understand, I want to acknowledge that this is a sensitive topic. It's a sensitive topic. You know it's a sensitive topic when you have to send all your emails to a coworker to read them first to make sure you don't accidentally get fired about anything, right? <laughs> it's a sensitive topic when you have to call your boss into your office and say, like, hey, I want you to look at this postcard before I send it, right? It's a sensitive topic. And like all sensitive topics, when you're talking about it, the reason it's sensitive is because when you're talking about it, you're really talking about the thing behind the thing, right? When you're talking about the topic, what, the reason it's so sensitive is there's so many variables and layers going on behind it. Remember a couple weeks ago? And we talked about evolution uh, in the Sunday service, also known as the Sunday I sweated more than any other Sunday uh, in a service, right? We talked about how over and over again there are disagreements between the biblical narrative of how things came to be and the scientific narrative of how things came to be, but for some reason evolution is the one that shoots everybody's wheels off, right? For some reason evolution is the one that makes people of no faith turn into people, or people of faith turn into people of no faith. For some reason evolution is the one that gets tied up in the courts and lawsuits. You know, why is this the such, with, why is this topic the one that's so sensitive? And we talked about the thing behind the thing, right? The thing behind the thing on the topic of evolution is because in some people's mind, if you start disputing the fact of a literal Adam and Eve, then you start disputing the fact of original sin. Then you start disputing the fact of sin nature. Then you start disputing the fact that all of us have sin. Then you start disputing the fact that we need a Christ, then you have disputing the fact of whether or not Jesus is even required for salvation, right? To some people, if you start undoing that, the thing behind the thing that's really at stake is what's happening with their salvation, right? And that's why evolution becomes such a sensitive topic. It's the thing behind the thing, right? So we're going to talk about the thing behind the thing on all these topics. We're going to talk about the thing behind the thing on sex. But one of the things I think is really important, if we take anything, I, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very understanding that if, if you to walk away with one good thing, you know, then it was a successful Sunday for me. One good thing I would love you to walk away with is that this is an important thing to talk about. Particularly, it's an important thing to talk about if you're a parent, if you have children, or if you influence the lives of young people, right? It's just something really negative happens when we take something as important as sex and just don't talk about it, right? And so the analogy I was trying to think about, the importance of just talking about it is coffee. It all comes back to that for me. I have a five-year-old son. His name's Henry. He's the worst. Um, (laughs) He's not. He's the best. I have a five-year-old son named Henry, and Henry sees over and over again the importance of coffee in our household, right? He sees coffee. When he comes to church, there's coffee going on. When he sees television, there's coffee. Coffee is consumed around him all the time, right? He gets all these cultural messages on coffee. So, of course, he has asked the question, can I have coffee, right? And the answer back to him, of course, was like, no, son, you can't have coffee right now. There, it's not appropriate for you. But what happens if our message to him was, don't acknowledge coffee. Don't look at coffee. Coffee's bad, don't touch coffee. Mm, mm, mm. 
no coffee for you. We don't do stuff like that. <laughs> what happens if he hears this message? No, 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 son, no coffee. Coffee's not for you. No coffee. Drink, right? What's going to happen the very second he's old enough to reach that coffee pot and no one's in the room? Right? What's going to happen? And he's going to do so with no guidance, with no framework. Instead, the language is, son, we have a mountain of evidence that coffee is damaging and inappropriate for someone of your age, right? This is something you have to be an adult. Someday you can have coffee. Someday coffee can be, a, if you so choose, a healthy part of your life, right? <laughs> have I stretched the metaphor too far? <laughs> 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 have I stretched the metaphor? The importance is if you don't talk about something, what you do is make it so taboo, so enticing, that, uh, that people rush into it headlong with no, you know, with no thought, no guidance, no interpretation, right? The importance is to have a discussion about it. In fact, if you went the opposite direction of every day, we sat down and said, son, your mom and dad are having coffee again. Let me tell you about coffee. Here's the importance of coffee. Here's different ways you can have coffee. He'd probably be like, the last thing I want to hear about is coffee, right? <laughs> We're talking about sex today, uh, and I want to acknowledge two things in the room. Two things. We're going to be, we're going to be uh, talking about sex, and this is going to be positive on the subject of sex. But before we get into any of that, I want to acknowledge something. We are a large group. I know for a fact that people in this room will have been abused sexually. They will have been victimized sexually. And I'm going to be talking positively about God's desire for sex in our lives, about the, the, the beauty of sex. I'm going to be talking positively. So to those of you who have experienced that abuse or have that in your family, I want to say two things to you first. What happened to you is not normal. It is not okay. And it is not your fault. Okay? If you're one of those people who have experienced that, if that's in your family, what happened to you is not normal. It is not okay. It is not part of God's vision for sex. It is not part of God's great plan for your life. It is not okay. And it is not your fault the first thing I need you to know. The second thing uh, I'm going to talk about is we're going to be talking about sex for the next couple weeks, and I am not going to be talking about sexual orientation. Right? I'm not going to be talking about sexual orientation, and the, the reasons for that are myriad. Uh, sexual orientation um, in, in disputes over how do we incorporate or not incorporate people with divergent understandings of their sexual under orientation into the life of the church is the divisive issue in our era, right? and not just in this church, in all churches. It doesn't matter how conservative you think a church is, how liberal and progressive and open a church is, every single church is having debates over that. Domestic churches, international churches, every single church is being torn asunder by those questions, right? Because it's not just about sexuality, it's about the thing behind the thing, right? How do we interpret the Bible? How do we understand our bodies? How do we understand God's will for us, right? The thing behind the thing. Here's what I do. I am willing to talk about my understanding of human sexuality from a personal and a biblical Christian standpoint till I'm blue in the face. However, I do not do it across power imbalances because it's just too sensitive of a topic, right? I only talk to people about that issue when they can talk back to me. I don't do it across power imbalances. And when there's a room of 220 people and one has a microphone and the rest don't, that's a power imbalance. So I'm happy to talk about it over and over and over again. If you so desire, I just do it one-on-one. -on -one. So if it's something you want to talk about, feel free, come talk. We can agree, we can disagree, who knows? I'm willing to do it as long as you want, but I only do it one-on-one. -on -one. So that's what's going to happen over the course of the series. I just wanted to line that out. Uh, this is a fraught issue. Um, so I was uh, talking with someone uh, just yesterday, and they said, I'm just kind of impressed that you're willing to stand up in front of a group of people and talk about sex, right? Uh, particularly from a Christian perspective. And, uh, and I understand that. I understand what you mean, because the Christian message about sex has been conflicted at best and very negative at worst, right? There's a story, have you ever heard of a man named Origen? He's a church family. He lived in the, like around 200, one of the big interpreters of faith. There's a story about Origen that as a young man, he was so uh, focused on being as devout as he could that he literally castrated himself for purposes of a holy life. And that story was told over and over again as like a celebration in the church, right? For hundreds of years. Like, look how great Origen is. Look at this satisfaction. There's a church father named Jerome. The story about him is every time he had a sexual impulse, he would throw himself into thorn bushes, right? To, to drive those impulses out of him. He would leap into thorn bushes. Uh, and that story is told over and over and over again as an act of celebration, right? There's, a, there's an extensive period of language that's coming from Paul in the New Testament where he's writing to communities, and over and over again, he's trying to stop. Uh, their behavior when they were part of a secular world and trying to change their behavior to a holy Christian way of living. And one of the biggest disconnects for those group of people were the sexual practices of their community. 
So over and over again, he's writing about sex acts, and he's saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, because they were a part of a culture that viewed bodies and sexuality in a very different way. But over and over again, those messages start to sound negative about sexuality. In some Christian communities, to this day, in order to be considered a minister of the gospel or have authority over the sacraments, you have to be celibate, right? Over and over and over again, these messages can lead us to believe that something about sex is bad or dirty or unholy or wrong right? And those are the messages that we're receiving. But is that true? Is that God's plan? Was that God's great idea, right? To bury something inside of us that was, that was wrong and negative and sinful and bad just because of how we're wired to be, right? Is that the image that we get in Genesis 2 when Adam and Eve are standing in front of each other, right? Is that the image that we get? I think that idea that there's something about the spirit which is good and the body which is bad and sinful and negative and all of its urges are to be discarded, that says a lot more about ancient Greek philosophy, than it does about the language of the Bible, right? And I'll be honest, the Bible has a very mixed message on sex, right? There's a lot of patriarch- patriarchal literature. There's a lot of misogynistic, uh, there's a lot of euphemism around sex. If, so, if you're ever reading the Bible and someone talks about how he uncovered his feet, that doesn't mean he took his sandals off. <laughs> the Bible's rated R, y'all. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw that out there. It's really rated R. We give it to third graders and we're like, please don't read all of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but do you realize a significant portion of the Bible, an entire book of the Bible, right, contrary to all of those images, is a book of erotic love poetry. Do you realize that? A significant portion of the Bible, of your sacred text, of foundational Judaism and Christianity text, is an erot- a collection of erotic love poems. Do you realize that? We're going to be turning to Song of Songs today. We're going to be reading out chapter 2. If you're in your Red Bible, it's page 519. I'm going to read um, from chapter 2. There's a couple things I need you to recognize about this language. Song of Songs is a remarkable book for a number of reasons. It's one of two books of the Bible that does not mention God. Right? It's a book of the Bible that doesn't mention God. It also doesn't mention um, the covenants. It doesn't mention the covenants of Israel. It doesn't mention the covenants of Zion. Uh, it's not about that. It's a, it's a book of erotic love poetry. It's also unique. It is the only book of the Bible whose predominant voice, whose protagonist, whose writer is unapologetically female, right? Not mitigated through a narrator. It is a book of erotic love poetry written by a female, right? Here's this language. We hear so much about the idea that, uh, that sex is dirty or to be shameful or to be uh, or to look down upon or it makes you unholy or makes you negative or makes you less than. Um, and then you, hear, you have this in your Bible, right? Chapter 2, verse 1. I'm a rose of the Sharon plain, a lily of the val- valleys, the woman writes. The man writes in response, like a lily among thorn bushes, so is my dearest among the young women. Then the woman writes to the man, like an apple tree, Among the wild trees, so is my lover among the young men. In his shade, I take pleasure in sitting, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He has brought me to the house of wine. His banner raised over me is love. Sustain me with raisin cakes. Strengthen me with apples, for I'm weak with love. His left arm is beneath my head. His right embraces me. Make a solemn pledge, daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the wild deer. Don't rouse, don't arouse love until it desires. Listen, it's my lover. Here he comes now. This is a portion I had to read at my friend's wedding, by the way. (laughs) Hey, my friend's a pastor. Let's have him read the scripture. And this is what I read. Listen, it's my lover. Here he comes now. Leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Here he stands now outside our wall, peering through the windows, peeking through the lattices. My lover spoke and said to me, rise up, my dearest, my fairest, and go. Here the winter is past, the rains have come and gone, blossoms have appeared in the land, the season of singing has arrived, and the sound of the turtle dove is heard on our land. The green fruit is on the fig tree, and the grapevines in bloom are fragrant. Rise up, my dearest, my fairest, and go. My dove in the rock crevices, hidden in the cliff face, let me catch sight of you. Let me hear your voice, the sound of your voice is sweet, and the sight of you is lovely. Catch foxes for us, those little foxes that spoil vineyards now that our vineyards are in bloom. I belong to my lover, and he belongs to me, the one grazing among the lilies. Before the day breeze blows and the shadows flee, turn about, my love, be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the jagged mountains. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. 
We have, a, we have a language that's unapologetically physical, that's unapologetically romantic, that's unapologetically intimate. One of the things that really strikes us as inconsistent, though, is that the language is so different, right? This is not the kind of language that we use in 2017, so we can miss the fact that it's supposed to be erotic or sensual or seductive, right? Now, we're about to read a response from the man to the woman, and just to help you understand how this plays in 2017, on Thursday night, my wife and I were reading our Kindles in bed, and I turned on my phone, and I recorded what happens when you try to seduce your wife using language of Song of Songs. <laughs> I don't know what I want to do that. Okay. You're pretty. Your hair is like a stream of goats as they come down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like newly shorn ewes as they come out of the washing pool. Is this in the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Or um, No, it's just I think your teeth are like newly shorn ewes as they come out of the washing pool. <laughs> <laughs> like a crimson ribbon on your lips. Yeah, what about it? <laughs> <laughs> like a slice of pomegranate is the curve of your face. Aww. Yeah. No, I'm hungry. <laughs> like David's tower is your neck. Splendidly built. Aww. Yeah. A thousand shields are on the pocket. <laughs> a thousand shields on your neck, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? It's hard you to understand. That's erotic poetry, right? That's seductive. That's from the heart, guys. That is a man reaching out to a woman, speaking his truth, right? But it's 2017. I need you to understand this. So I'm going to read that scripture again, but I'm going to do so in a way that might help you understand, right, Dave? Look at you, so beautiful, my dearest. Look at you, so beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind the veil of your hair. Your hair is like a flock of goats as they stream down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like newly shorn ewes as they come up from the washing pool. All of them perfectly matched. None of them lacks its twin. See, this is why we have to do this, y'all. Like a crimson ribbon are your lips. When you smile, it is lovely like a slice of pomegranate is the curve of your face behind the veil of your hair. Like David's tower is your neck, splendidly built. A thousand shields are hung upon it, all the weapons of the warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle doe that graze among the lilies. Before the day breeze blows and the shadows flee, I will be off to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. You are utterly beautiful, my dearest. There's not a single flaw in you. God speaks to us through the reading <laughs> of Scripture. With the aid of Reverend Al Green. What does it say about, what does it say about us? That for thousands of years, faithful people of God have read that Scripture and seen truth in it have seen capital T truth in it, have seen spiritual truth in it to the point of making a sacred scripture, what does it say about us? What does it say about God? That God honors and reveals God's self in the reading of that scripture over and over and over again. One of the things I need you to understand about yourself is that your sexuality speaks a great deal about who you understand yourself to be, who you understand others to be, and who you understand God to be. So who are you? You are not an animal. 
You are not just a collection of hormones. You are not just a collection of chemicals locked in on some path set out to you by your biology. When you say all teenagers are going to have risky sex, when you say all men are going to cheat, you are reducing someone to an animal and they are not that. At the same time, you are not an angel. You are not disembodied spirit. You are not made dirty or unclean or unholy by the actions of your body. You are not an angel. You are a human. You are flesh and blood, and the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. You are made for connection and interaction, to know and be known. And when that need, when that desire, when that inbuilt inbuilt characteristic of you is funneled through your spirit, in your mind, in your understanding, that is your spirituality. And when that inborn characteristic of you is funneled through your physicality, that is your sexuality. That is you. Your spirituality and your sexuality are two sides of the same coin. You are made for connection, for intimacy, to know and be known. That's who you are. So next week, we're going to be talking a lot about um, the foundations of understanding that. The so what's, the now what's, the what now's, right? We're going to be talking a lot about the X's and the O's. We're going to be talking a lot about the ways that we connect with this. We're going to be talking about the ways that we live into this. But what I need you to know walking away from this place, whether you are seven or 77, is that your spirituality and your sexuality are connected, right? Your sexuality is part of who God made you to be. It is God's idea, not your idea. It does not make you dirty or wrong, unholy or unclean. Know this. You are worthy of love and of being loved. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body is beautiful. You are beautiful and you are made to reach out, to connect in intimate love to your God who made you. And that same God put in you the ability to do so with others. That is God's idea. And it is beautiful. Let us pray. Great and loving God, we embrace the reality that you placed deep in all of us the Imago Dei, the image of you, the image of you that bears witness to connection, to intimacy, to knowing and being known. Oh God, we embrace the fact that you made us to live in these bodies with these abilities with these characteristics, with these needs. God, we strive in all that we do to be holy, perfect, and blameless before you, to live as you intended us to be, to honor you with all that we are and all that we have, and to enjoy the fullness of our being now and every day of our lives. Oh God, guide us, teach us, show us your ways, and in all things, Make us in the image of your Son, Jesus the Christ, your perfect example of your will and your ways, in whose name we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.